but since you are a phenomenal counselor, marriage, family, individual counselor. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Why, um, can, you, can we talk about infidelity for a moment? Yeah, and, that's a great thing to talk about. Yeah, I'm wondering, do you see typically, can you pinpoint a reason why it happens? Yes. Like whether it's from the, man, the male side or the female side. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, oh, and you know what? You sparked for me too, Megan. We should preface this by saying, have you ladies ever heard a guy say, or even a woman say, that's just how guys are? Oh, all the time. Or he's a man. <laughs> right. Like, it's a given that men cannot be monogamous. And uh, it's funny, and maybe it's my own personal experience growing up in my family with my father and my two younger brothers and my younger stepbrother. Um, all three of my brothers who are, you know, we've confided in each other a lot over the years. I mean, we've told each other stuff. And, um, but my three little brothers are like, but they're not so little anymore. My one brother, Danny, whose birthday is tomorrow, <gasps> tomorrow, his birthday is tomorrow, May 14th, um, has always said, stop calling me your little brother. He said, I'm not your little brother. They're grown men, they're grown ass men. He just wants you to say younger. He's being quiet. <laughs> yeah, that. my younger brother, my three younger <laughs> brothers. But my father was always very monogamous and a devoted person. And um, my mother was too. My parents were monogamous and they got divorced and then they started dating around. Um, but my brothers ended up like my dad. They're very monogamous, committed family men. They're, all three of them wanted marriage and children and a beloved, so um, really good men. So I want to clarify one thing. When it said that's just how men are, that men are dogs, men are going to cheat because that's how men are wired. That is not true. This is true though. Here's the reason why it seems so chronic, prevalent with men to cheat, but women cheat too, obviously, we know, is because men who are not trained in the feminine ways, men who are having masculine oriented sex, are in fact more likely to cheat on their mate. A man who's, and masculine oriented sex is this, and this is what men are all trained to do, masculine oriented sex, goal oriented sex. And the goal is, do you ladies know what the goal is in masculine oriented sex? To finish. The ice cream cone at the end? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the ice cream cone at the end. That to sounds finish. better. What? To finish. To finish. Right. The orgasm. Mm -hmm. They're having sex to get an orgasm. That's the goal in masculine-oriented sex. Feminine-oriented sex is not goal-oriented. It's purpose-oriented, and the purpose is connection. Connection, depth of experience, um, extending the ecstasy as long as possible, the build, the slow building of the ecstasy. So I've always said that when I'm teaching Tantra, I teach a lot of Tantra occasionally. I mean, I teach a lot of Tantra individually because when I'm doing couples counseling, I do give Tantra exercises, Tantric exercises. But I've always said that women heat up like a steam kettle and men heat up like a firecracker. <laughs> so a man having masculine oriented sex, which is goal oriented sex, is designed to, so when he's kissing her, he's thinking, how soon would be too soon to put my hand down her pants? Because that's really the reason why I'm kissing her. <laughs> I'm not kissing her to drink her in. And this is not all men, so men don't get upset with me. This is not all men, but this is a man in the immature masculine, and usually it takes a man some time and or to meet a good woman that he falls in love with to be able to step up into the mature masculine where it's not all about the goal. The goal is the orgasm. Even a man... In um, having masculine oriented sex, in the immature masculine, who is trying to please the woman, he's trying to get her to orgasm because that means he won. He, accom he accomplished a goal. I did it. I made her come. 
So it's still about feeding his ego or his needs. A man who's in the mature masculine and having feminine or masculine oriented sex is pleasuring his woman because there is so much joy and ecstasy in just playing her body like a virtuoso who is a master cellist <laughs> as opposed to just you know picking up a you know ukulele or a banjo no offense ukulele or banjo players <laughs> those are great instruments too but like banging out a tune and not, not that animal sex is not bad animal sex is fine it's just the reason why women shut down sexually is because of too much masculine oriented sex watch for my TED talk my Fountain Hills TED talk coming up in God knows when after the quarantine's done <laughs> so Megan back to your question which is like the most important question which is why do people cheat why? Why do they cheat? So there's specific reasons. There's four specific reasons. And people cheat because of one or more of these four reasons. So whenever couples come in and they're working on an infidelity, I always ask them, uh, the person who cheated, I ask them these questions. Which one or more of these four did you, is the reason you cheated? Something was missing from the relationship. Something's actually missing. And the cheater either didn't have the guts, the nerve, the courage, or the language to be able to say to their mate, there is something I really need from this relationship that isn't there. And we have to fix this or I will have to leave the relationship. So something's missing and they don't have the maturity or the courage or the language to say so. The second reason is a punishment or a payback. So sometimes people cheat because they're mad at their mate and they're immature and they, instead of talking to their partner and working things out with their mate, they cheat on them to punish them. Very immature. The third reason is maturity. Some people just really don't have the level of maturity it takes to state a commitment Take a vow, make a commitment to somebody for monogamy, and keep the commitment. Keep their word. Like some people are just not grown up enough to realize my word is my bond. What am I if not my word? I'm nothing if not my word. So some people just aren't grown up enough to realize that. And the fourth reason is self-hatred. So some people just have a certain degree of self-hatred that they will sabotage any relationship they're in. It doesn't matter. It's not about you. It's that they have a certain disdain for themselves that they will screw up anything good for themselves. Something good in their life, they will screw it up. So it's a kind of self-hatred. So I'm just gonna go over those quickly. Something's missing, a punishment or a payback, lacking maturity, self-hatred leading to self-sabotage. So those are the four reasons a person will cheat. It can be one or more of those reasons. Go ahead. So it sounds like with the last two, those are personal issues. It has nothing to do with the partner. Really, all of these are kind of personal issues, right? Right, but, right, but the first two are about the other person. Right, but the last reaction. two are, it sounds like something they probably came into the relationship with from the get-go. Absolutely, which so, they did all four, but you're right. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're dealing with a person who's dysfunctional, I, it, 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 most people, most of us have some level of all of these things, right? Dysfunction, yep. Yeah. We so, all have our issues. it's like, how do you find a person who has ever overcome all of that and mature enough and communicative enough and healthy and strong enough to really be in a, a monogamous marriage? A love and relationship. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? We should talk about that piece. You bring this up in this really, really important part, too, about monogamy. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. Yeah, so we're going to do a segue, and then we're going to remind me what you okay. just asked me, because it's a really important uh, uh, question. Okay. Not all people are naturally monogamous, and that's completely okay. Like, some people are right-handed, some people are left-handed, and one of the questions...
She's a cutie. Yeah. We need to get her in here. Oh my god. <laughs> take over the world. That dog would take over the world. Oh. Um, we might have to cut that part out. Her barking. If you're gonna bark, go outside. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there isn't a right and wrong in terms of monogamous or polyamorous. So when couples come in to work with me on infidelities. Uh, I almost always ask them, you know, unless they've already told me, I, I always ask them, is this an open relationship or is this a monogamous committed relationship? So um, I did have one couple a couple of years ago and it was a semi-open relationship. So there's open, there's semi-open relationships. Uh, so there's wide open, mm -hmm. all the way open. Mm -hmm. Do what you want with whom you want. And um, let me know or don't let me know. Here's our agreement. You make agreements. Then there's relationships that, that are semi-open. There's a monogamous uh, commitment, and then with uh, a conversation and a talk. Yes, you can go be with that person, or um, do you mind if I go if I sleep with this person? There's a conversation and an agreement. Um, then there's a there's a continuum. There's triads. There's quads and up. And there's monogamous. It's just those two people. That's it. And then, of course, there's uh, celibate, which means you can pleasure yourself. And there's abstinent, which means you don't have sex with anybody else and you don't pleasure yourself. Abstinent. So sometimes people are, practice abstinence for uh, spiritual growth. It's a great thing to try if you've never tried it. It's, uh, and also great to try celibacy. So we can cut out the telephone ringing. <laughs> Sales people. So is, do you want, how much time do we have? Do you want to get into a conversation over, over this? We can, I have like 40 minutes. Okay. So I'm gonna come back to your question as soon as that stops. Okay, I think we're done. Oh, one more. Telephone ringing. <laughs> you guys on Facebook Live Feed, if you have any questions there, Go ahead and ask them, and I'll come back later, and I'll answer them. Oh, God, you know what we could do? Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I might have you, Holly, read if someone has a question for me. Okay. But um, don't worry about it for right now. Okay. Since this is our first time, we don't want yeah. to have too many moving parts. No, I know. Okay. It's going to be long. So, um, the couple that, I, that had a semi-open relationship, they came in to see me a few years back. Um, they had agreements to speak with each other if they wanted to sleep with somebody else. And the issue was uh, they wanted to do counseling because she had found that he had privately messaged a woman that he had slept with with her permission. And that was against their agreements. And so they had to work through that trust. So it works the same in a in a open relationship as it does in a monogamous relationship. It depends on what your agreements are. So for uh, what we're talking about, we're talking about more monogamy, although these concepts work just the same in a semi-open or open relationship because it's, it's all based on agreements. So in a monogamous uh, relationship, now your question, say your question again. Well, how do you, how could anyone be healthy enough? to enter a healthy, monogamous relationship. Right, right, right. So, you're so right, Megan. People have their issues, their obstacles, their programming, their traumas from childhood mm -hmm. that interfere with their beloved relationship. And beloved relationship is like prime, fertile ground to shine the light on any unresolved issues that need to be resolved. Like, more than any other kind of love, maybe parent-child love is the other one that is more triggering. But in a beloved relationship, it's even more trigger triggering than a parent-child relationship because in a beloved relationship, you feel like you could walk away, but you choose to stay and work on it if you're mature enough. In a parent-child relationship, even if you walk away, you still feel like you're connected to that person through blood. So it doesn't feel like a chosen relationship. You don't feel like you could just walk away and decide, oh, I'm going to forget about that person because it's your parent or your child. 
So um, that's harder in that respect. But the love and relationship is harder in the respect that you decide to stay and work on things. And when someone has the maturity to go into a beloved relationship and give their word in a monogamous relationship to be monogamous and to talk about issues that come up, that is, uh, it, a lot of people learn their maturity through beloved love. That's where they do their growing up, because you know this person could leave you if you screw up too badly. And uh, boy, if I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. Well, if I've said this once, I've probably said it 10,000 times. Most people don't have the mental, emotional maturity to uh, have beloved love. Most people do their growing up in their beloved relationship. So some of the most important things, I think, and I've interviewed a lot of people, and uh, especially my brother Jimmy and his wife Ilana, who have been together for like 25, 26 years, and five kids. When I watch them and I see what they have that works, it looks like it's respect. They listen to each other's opinions. They hear each other. And humor. So... Those two things get them through a lot. And they have chemistry. I think you have to have chemistry. If you don't have chemistry, that's not a thing that we can conjure up. So when people come to me and they say, our sex life, life is gone, which is another great topic, our, our sex life is gone, then um, I say, okay, well, first thing I want to know is, was there chemistry in the beginning? Because if there was no chemistry in the beginning, we can't conjure that. That's a magical thing all its own that makes you addicted a little bit to that person so that you'll stay and work on things. So um, there's two other things about infidelity, and then I want to hear more from you guys, um, that determines whether or not people get over it or not. So those four reasons that people cheat, the uh, cheater, for lack of a better word, has to understand which of those reasons they cheated so that they know exactly what to work on. So if they cheated because something's missing, they have to get really good at saying what's missing and expressing their thoughts and feelings and uh, getting that missing thing in place in their beloved relationship and being responsible for saying when they see it starting to slip away because mm -hmm. old habits die hard. Um, so people have to understand, if I'm, if I'm immature and my style is to get mad at you for something and then be passive aggressive and do some kind of payback, mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna have to really watch myself like a hawk, practice self-observation so I can get over that. A payback, cheating on somebody, I mean, really? <laughs> anyway, and having the maturity to give your word and keep your word and um, to work on your self-hatred, you know? You know how we do that? How do we do that? How do we work on self-hatred in study group? Self-hatred? Yes. What do we do talk about the most in study group? Read your voice and yeah. observing your, your thoughts. Self-observation. Yeah. Yes. What are mm -hmm. what, what is self-observation and what are mean liar voices? So mean liar voices are, um, I like the way Megan, you always explain it. You say it's like, um, so it's the things <laughs> that you say to your subconscious and you're not really aware of it. Um, when you say things to yourself like, I'm not good enough. I can never amount to that. And sometimes you're not really aware of it. So when you start actually observing your thoughts and you start to catch those mean liar voices and realize, shut up, get out of my head, you don't own me, and you start to kind of retrain your brain and give yourself more positive <coughs> thoughts where you're not, you know, breaking yourself down. Because um, sometimes we don't know where those thoughts come from. They can come from our childhood. They can come from just um, not being um, confident enough. But we all have them, whether we realize it or not. And we just have to be aware of it and realize, um, okay, shut up. Get out of here. You don't own me. And um, slowly but surely, you start to realize that um, I can overcome this. I deserve more. I deserve better things in life. And... Eventually it works. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. How do you describe it, Megan? Yeah, I, I just think of it as that internal dialogue that it has been with us, <clears throat> nagging us for so many years that we don't even recognize it or hear it anymore. It's kind of like when I get in the car 
And people are like, put your seatbelt on because the bell has been dinging for 10 minutes. I don't even hear it because mm -hmm. I ignore it. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I do. And so it's like that's the voice. But you change that, right? You start I'm, I'm working it. on that. I'm working on that, yeah. <laughs> but it's like that voice that's like you don't even hear it anymore because we've heard it for so long. You know, oh, my God, you screwed that up again. Oh, my God, is this really going to happen? You know, it's that negativity. And yeah. it takes stepping back and being that fly on the wall, looking down at your own life and your own mm -hmm. mind and your own brain and seeing what's going on. And right. wow, look at that dialogue. What if you said that to someone else? Would you say that to your best friend? Right. Your child? Right. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's having like the bird's eye view or the God's eye view. You have to practice self-observation to catch the mean liar voices, to change your internal dialogue. Mm -hmm. That's what fixes self-hatred. Uh, what people usually do is they start trying to get the people around them to stop being shitty to them. And what people don't realize is there's a spiritual law that whatever you say to yourself about yourself determines your place in this world. Mm -hmm. So if you've been calling yourself inside your head stupid, lazy, and you don't even notice it after so many years of doing it. I'm dumb, I'm lazy, I'm fat, I'm not muscular enough, not strong enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve love then you'll attract people that match what you're saying to yourself. In fact, when I'm doing child family counseling and uh, I have parents come in on their own sometimes, usually first, I have parents come in and they say, my teen is saying this to me or even my little kid is saying this to me, really mean things. And I say, okay, we're going to talk about self-talk. Help me understand what you say to yourself about yourself mm -hmm. that's unkind. Oh, I say this and this. I pick on myself all the time. And I'm like, they pick it up through osmosis, even if you never say it out loud, your kid will start saying to you the mean things that you say to you, and so will your mate. So, hair sticking on the side. So, really important. So, to your question, Megan, how do people, can you, like, completely fix yourself and then go into a beloved relationship? Or can you find somebody that is thoroughly actualized, self-actualized, through and through, and then get into a love relationship. <laughs> and uh, if you wait for that, you're going to be waiting a really long time. Because um, you, you can do a whole lot of work on yourself, and then it, as an individual in your own bubble of yourself, or with your teacher or your you know, fellow students, and do that work. But as soon as you get into a beloved relationship, Anything that was so deeply hidden that was dormant in there will be triggered. The closer you get to another person, the more that dormant stuff will be triggered. And we used to say at Omega Vector, which is a really fantastic free weekend self-awareness workshop that we are restarting and it'll be up and running in just a couple of months because we're almost through the facilitator training. We used to say if it's on its way up, it's on its way out. So don't push it back down. Or don't say stop doing X because you're triggering... It, I mean, I take that back. It's okay for you to say to a beloved, you know, when you do such and such, it lands with me like this. And then if you're both adult enough, you have an opportunity to take a look at it. Well, is it you, is it me, or is it the combination of us uh, recycling this particular pattern, whatever mm -hmm. pattern? So back to the infidelity. So great question. Thank you for the question. Um, back to the infidelity. So there's two things. There's a specific thing that will determine whether a couple can heal after an infidelity. This is what I've noticed after 27 years of counseling, helping couples with infidelities. So this one question will determine if they can bounce back from it. The question is, did you confess the infidelity or did you get caught? Mm. If a person confessed, hold on, I don't know why I'm so itchy right here. <laughs> Maybe the dog gave me some fleas. No, she doesn't have fleas. <laughs> Beaver all out big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll, that'll be in the, um, what do you call it, the blooper. The blooper. Um, the beloved that got cheated on knows that if they caught you, they, they know in the back of their mind, even if they don't want to admit it out loud, that they don't know 
Number one, if you would have ever told them. Mm -hmm. And number two, all the hundred other things you probably did and didn't tell them that they didn't find. That's why it's so hard. Now, if someone had an infidelity and it was like a one-time thing and they come to their mate and they say, two days ago or over this past weekend when I was, you know, at that thing, I don't know what happened. I, I cheated on you. I slept with somebody and I feel horrible and it's eating me up inside and I need you to know. I need to tell you about it. And I need us to go to counseling and really work on it. And I'm going to find a way to make this up to you. And it's never happened before. And it'll never happen again. And I don't have a pattern of cheating in my past relationships. And uh, I can't believe I did this. I feel horrible. Now, that couple has a chance to heal from that infidelity. So, um, but even that couple, it's going to be 50-50 if they can come back from that. These are just my own personal statistics that I've noticed in my own practice. Mm -hmm. But a beloved who got caught cheating, I'm, this is really sad to say, but I've never seen those couples make it. Not even once. Not even once. So it sounds like to me that the reason that they may not work out in every time that you've noticed it is because... They don't have that communication, they don't have that maturity, so if they don't have it then, you know, they obviously have a lot of work to do, and it's probably not worth mending at that point for some people, of course. Not to say that it's impossible, right? But it sounds like that maturity was never there, which is why it happened in the first place. Right. And also, the whole the sad thing about that instant, that type of situation is the person who got cheated on is running a certain amount of denial. Right. And it can take them a long time to realize, wow, you really fucked me over. Go to hell. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes even though they know they were cheated on, they still don't want to let go of the relationship. And then, sorry, I grabbed my knuckles for taking that one out too. Um, and that person usually gets cheated on again. What were you going to say, Megan? Um, well, I would just think that a lot of people that go to counseling, I mean, it's so hard. Um, not everyone has the fortitude to work on themselves and to go inside and to want to heal themselves. That, right. You know, we live in a band-aid society. We want to pop a pill or go to a counselor and have you fix it. And really what they mean is, I want you to fix the other person. And that other person wants you to fix the other person. Mm -hmm. And so nobody really wants to work on themselves, right? So, well, I mean, not the people, the people that see me. Uh-huh. Because I'm, I'm a very loving, strict counselor. Right. <laughs> but I mean, for so, your, for the success rate, for the for the marriage to work general. out, both people will have to want to work not oh, only on the relationship yeah. but on themselves. Yeah. And it's sometimes hard right. to find people who are set in their ways who want to work on themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's Megan, kind of where the proof is in the pudding, because here's what I mean by I'm a strict counselor. When a couple contacts me to schedule a session, I've learned from, from doing it for 27 years and also now I'm, <coughs> I'm 60. Now I'm 60, so I'm less likely to put up with bullshit. You know, so if people want to come and just kind of complain about each other, I don't do that. So I, I ask them before they schedule, what are the main issues you're working on? And... I also say, watch these videos, and they get my free... By the way, anybody watching this, just ask me, um, text me, and I'll send you my top three couples educational videos. Healthy communication, healing old wounds, and bonding exercises for couples. So they have to watch... I tell them, you must watch these three videos before you come in for your session. Now, if there's an infidelity, I usually send another one or two videos that they have to watch. If when they get into session, one or both of them haven't watched the videos, I tell them, I only work with people that are serious about the work. Otherwise, we're wasting your money and our time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not into, I'm not one of those therapists that's into people paying them for years for therapy for, um, you know, sitting and talking. I'm not interested in that. When I had my hysterectomy, and you know, everything goes crazy hormonally. 
Yes. Well, they said they were going to put me on hormones, blah, blah. <clears throat> um, I wanted to start working out and getting back into bodybuilding again and build up muscle. So they were going to give me estrogen and testosterone, and I asked the doctor to double my testosterone, which he did. I started going crazy sexually. Like, <laughs> so my sex drive was through the roof, cra online all the time. Oh. Like, and it was just like, I suddenly had this, I mean, I immediately got off of it. I, I dropped down to using no hormones at all, and I'm totally happy and fine. But what happened was I was just going absolutely insane because I had this testosterone. So it gave me this compassion for men, like men who can like put the reins on that and, and keep that tamper down. Yeah. Wow. Uh, because, Ooh, I mean, seriously, it's uncontrollable. I yeah. was like, anytime, anywhere, I don't care. Like, it was <laughs> non I, I can't even tell you. I've never been <clears throat> that crazy before. Mm. And it's I'm like, is this how point. men feel? So I can understand if they cheat. My God, when you have that kind of drive, it's, it's like a wild animal inside of you. Uh, so let's talk about that. I'm so glad you said that story, Megan. Um, because it's right to the point of, uh, first of all, let's have more compassion for men who have learned about redirecting their sexual energy up their center line. Mm -hmm. Men, tantra men, enlightened men, men who practice sac sacred sexuality, men who can send all that sexual energy up their center line so it charges up their heart chakra to sound a little, you know, woo-woo for a second. So men who can do that, men who have learned how to have a full body feminine orgasm that can go for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour or a day or three days, a man who learns how to have an extended full body feminine orgasm like that that is just rolling for days that empowers his life with his sensuality, sexuality, and his love. That is a man that knows how to pierce the feminine mood with his love. That is a man who knows how to ravish and ravage the feminine and rip her open to God. So really important things that David Data talks about all the time. David Data, The Way of the Superior Man, which is a brilliant book that everyone should read. So David Data is obviously a tantra man and he talks about how to redirect sexual energy. He doesn't teach the tantra, but you can tell by his language that he's learned it. So that is a great point, Megan. So a man who is running, David Davey even talks about this too. A man who is running his sexual energy, who's in love with his woman, who has a monogamous commitment, might be in line at the grocery store, standing behind a beautiful woman with a beautiful ass. So when this enlightened, sexy man, who has all this sexual energy, testosterone coursing through him, his eyes happen to fall upon this gorgeous woman's sexy ass, big, nice, juicy ass, right in front of him at the grocery store. He will see it, and something different will happen in him, in the mature man, than in the immature man. The immature man will start running this energy of, gotta give me that, <laughs> gotta give me some of that. How do I jump on that? How do I monkey jump, bitch slap, donkey fuck that woman? Look at that ass! <laughs> That's what that man will do. This mature man in his sensual, sexual energy running it up his center line will see that beautiful ass and he will linger on it with his eyes and he will drink that ass in just like the sunset. This needs to be a rap song, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> drink that ass in. Like the sunset. <laughs> Let's send that to Kanye. And when, <laughs> yes. and when he's looking at this woman's rear end, he's enraptured with the beauty 
the curve, the gently sloping, sexy, sensual energy of the feminine. So it isn't about that ass and getting my dick in there. It's about this incredible, infinite, creative, inspiring, feminine power. It's a different experience. And that man will go right back to taking that energy to his beloved, to his woman. And that sensual feminine beauty, because a man, you know, sees the feminine walking around and it's just like, if it's a grown-up man, a mature man, it'll charge him up with love and desire for his woman. Mm -hmm. A man in the immature will be like, I have to have that and that and that and that and that and he'll eat everything on the table at the smorgasbord and then instead of being enlightened after sex, he will just be floated, full of, floated <laughs> and yeah, and just yes. more asleep, you know, in, a, in more of a sleep state. So, well, I mean, this is all a beautiful concept, but what percentage of men do you think are like that? The small. Yeah. Very yeah. small percentage of men even understand enlightenment. There's a movie I want to recommend. It's called uh, Don John, Don John's Addiction. I watched that. Oh. Don John's Addiction. Good movie. J-O-N, Don John's Addiction. Joseph Gordon-Levitt wrote, directed, and stars in that movie. Brilliant movie about sexual addiction. And how, like he wakes up every day and he jacks off. And then he goes and he works out. And then he meets a cute girl and then he tries to screw her. He gets porn addicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the beginning of my practice, I used to, um, my place was on Highland and 16th Street, which is right up the road from the highlighter strip joint. Oh, okay. <laughs> and one of those women there found her way to my practice and they are a tight knit bunch. And so I had a lot of exotic dancers. In my counseling practice, this is, we're talking about 27 years ago. And um, what was funny at the same time was a cop found her way to my practice and then told her cop friends, because they're tight-knit. So a lot of times I would have, there would be a stripper leaving <laughs> with a cop passing by her. <laughs> so um, I had to teach strippers how to dance. I mean, I didn't, like, dance, well, sometimes I did, because I'm, a trained belly dancer, but um, I had to teach the strippers how to dance in a way that they would feel empowered and in a way that caused awakening in the men that were viewing them instead of putting those men into more of a sleep state. They were dancing with more presence and those strippers that I taught got bigger tips. They made more money. Big tips. Wow. So that's an important point that you made about um, you have more compassion for men because they're driven by this it is a drug in the body, testosterone. So you understand that when a man is running testosterone and he's feeling turned on and, um, you know, he's, during those times in his life, those years and years where he's peaked sexually, and the saddest invention ever is Viagra because now a man is finally slowing down to the same speed as his woman, and now he can actually understand why more foreplay is a handy thing. It's a good thing. More. More foreplay. It takes him longer to become turgid, you know, erect. Mm -hmm. It takes him longer to orgasm. Now he's more in the time of his life where he's more in his feminine power, understanding the feminine way of sex. So this testosterone, just like you said, it's a drug. It's a drug. Period. So when a man d can't understand why his woman's so emotional, and he tells her, calm down, really calm down. And I say, I want you, th this is gonna be my new analogy because my analogy used to be, okay dude, imagine if I lined up eight shots of tequila, told you to down them right after, one after the next, and now I want you to walk on a straight line and say the alphabet backwards and stand on one foot and touch your nose with your eyes closed. You couldn't, because of the chemicals that are now in your body from the tequila. I tell him it's like that. So telling your woman, calm down, when she's the ocean, she's the ocean. Don't stop trying to fit her into the bathtub. <laughs> so she's not only got a menstrual cycle, which connects her with the turn of the tides and the changing of the moons, moon, but she's got this big corpus callosum connecting the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So the, 
the feminine is thinking and feeling at the same time all the time. So it's a different body and it's a different body chemistry. So when you tell her to calm down, it's like me saying, walk that straight line after eight shots of tequila. You couldn't, you can't, because of the chemistry, the chemicals in your body. Um, so that's going to be my new analogy. Imagine you're horny and I say, just calm that shit down. <laughs> just calm the fuck right. down. So the other point is, even though we have all this body chemistry going on, and I've had this conversation with uh, astrology friends, we, we have our tendencies based on our body, body chemistry and brain, and programming and childhood and trauma. We have our tendencies. Enlightenment is desired because enlightenment brings us up out and over, above, all of our body tendencies. So to be able to sit up on the curtain rod, gently watch your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and decide, okay, I can see myself heading down that road that always ends up with potholes and eventually a huge ditch where my car falls in, where I get stuck. And I have to start all over again and I have to get a new job or I have to you know, get divorced or start a new relationship where I have to, you know, talk to Child Protective Services or something. Things that people do when they see themselves heading down that same road because of their tendencies, physical, mental, emotional tendencies. This is why we want enlightenment. So that we can rise above all of our <clears throat> mental, emotional, physical tendencies that pull us. Because you have your astrological sign that, that, I don't know about this, so I shouldn't talk about it, but yeah, people have an astrology sign and they have certain tendencies. An Enneagram. The, uh, yeah, Enneagram, that pull you in certain directions, but still, that doesn't have to be in charge of you. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, one of the most wonderful kinds of people that you can be in a beloved relationship with is a person where both of you, both people are practicing self-observation, mm -hmm. noticing when they're doing their automatic behaviors, noticing it in themselves and letting their partner know, calling their partner on their shit, and having each of you being able to have the mentally emotional maturity to say, hmm, okay, you know what, you're right. I'm doing my pattern. Thank you for letting me know. I'll take a look at that. And then the next step is not guilt. <laughs> not guilt oh my gosh when like i felt angry because i thought the dog weed on the floor and then i realized later that was my tea mm -hmm. and even though i didn't bark at her or punish her in my heart i was angry at her because i forgot i spilled tea on the carpet you know i was running i was late for a thing oh i said to myself i want to be a better mommy i don't want to be the mommy that gets angry when the kid, the doggy, makes a mistake. Because I thought it was her that was me. So that's what, so can we, can we all be enlightened first and then get into a beloved relationship? I don't know, maybe if you dated Jesus Christ or <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi or somebody, but even those guys weren't good to date because they were all focused on how to serve the people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it just it just seems like a magic formula to find people who are on the same wavelength working on those things. I mean, it's just so rare, so rare. And maybe that's why they do say that those long-term monogamous beautiful relationships are so very rare because not that many people are evolving right. or no. working on themselves. And then to find two random people who are working on themselves and they end up together. Wow. Right. Well, you are more likely... Can I pause for a second? Yeah. Will you turn my air one notch warmer? Mm -hmm. So you have to hold the up button yep. until you see it blinking, and then it should go up one. Yep. Thanks, hon. So, is it rare? It. I think it is rare because... And, and you can find more people that are more like-minded if you hang out places like Omega. I used to meet a lot of like-minded people, Omega Vector and different self-awareness facilities. 
right. places where people are devoted to self-awareness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But then you have to be aware of those people that will damage you with that. Mm -hmm. It's the, um, you know, the self-awareness junkies that make other people wrong for not doing it or not being aware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I think those relationships... The reason why they're rare is because it's so easy to incur so much damage growing up. It's so easy. <laughs> Life is so fraught with pitfalls and traps where you get where you will get stuck and mm -hmm. abused, and that can stay with you. And so, I mean, fortunately, there's an easy way to heal that my brief therapy technique for healing childhood trauma. Yeah. To heal that. Yeah. So, but and, yeah, it's part of the journey. And I think sometimes, I think most of the time, people aren't aware of those issues. They didn't realize that they were traumatized, and this is the cause and effect of that. Yeah. And I think that's why it can be rare, because it's like, oh, I realized 15 years down the road that this was my tendency, and I was doing that, and then I looked for help. And then I started working on myself and all that yeah. stuff. So it sounds like it could be a long, a long road. Right. It's part of the journey. Right. And um, I just realized we have like one minute to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, that's a really good point, Holly. The the pitfalls, the traumas. I used to say this all the time. So. I used to say when a client comes in and sits down on my couch. I can tell exactly what they will be master of because it is your lumps of coal from your life traumas that when uh, we heal them and from under tons of pressure from life, those become your diamonds. Mm -hmm. So it is true that your traumas do become what you are master of. They become your strengths. They they become what you are teacher of. So profound. And it's all part of the journey. So I don't ever want to hear anybody say, why didn't I figure this out 15 years ago? My, I got divorced. My family broke up. My kids have to go between households. Because that wasn't the way it was meant to go. It was meant to go the way it went. And it's all part of the journey. So picking on yourself really doesn't help anything. So the last thing I'll say is love yourself, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. Mercy, mercy, mercy on you. It's a hard journey, but some of it's really fun.